I call to order the City of Las Vegas Historic Preservation Commission for uh, May 28th, a Wednesday, 2014. Please call the roll. Chair Stoldoff? Here. Vice Chair White? Excused. Member Wright? Excused. Member Housh? Excused. Member Clink? Excused. Member Beck? Excused. Member Hotchkiss? Here. Member Surfoss? Here. Member Bellis? Here. Member McMillan Ar Arnold? Present. Member Levine? Here. Member Millman? Here. Member Mooney? Here. And we do have a quorum. Two, uh, two quick announcements. One, uh, for the record, uh, Dorothy Wright uh, has retired or resigned hmm. uh, to focus on taking care of herself. Mm -hmm. uh, Submitted a letter to uh, uh, to the commission, supporting and, and uh, I spoke with her. Things are headed in the right direction, but she needs to focus on it. So that will move, move forward. And secondly, I'm wondering what David did to we all moved over to the corner. <laughs> 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 I know. I got the My personality, obviously. <laughs> uh, number two, have the uh, this meeting uh, compliance with the open meeting law. Yes, we are. Item number three, public comment during this portion of the agenda must be limited to matters on the agenda for action. If you wish to be heard, give your name for the record. The amount of discussion as well as the amount of time any single speaker is allowed may be limited. Would anybody like to speak at this point? If I may, I just would like to introduce our intern, Whitney Brooks. Hi. Hi. Uh, <laughs> she, she is funded through SHPO, and so she's working on some joint SHPO city projects. She's a graduate student in historic preservation at Georgia State. But from here. Okay. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. Well, allow me, if I may, I'll just, we, we unfortunately have a, an extern, which means she pays her school to work for us. So I'm sorry, this is Ricky Perkins. She's a, she'll be a third year at Boyd School of Law next year. Okay. All right. Yay. All right. Interns, externs. Oh. Outturns. And then some of us are just perennial interns. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, item number four, for possible action to approve the final minutes by reference of the regular meeting of April 23rd, 2014. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second? That's second. Second. Discussion. Hearing no discussion from the audience or from the commission, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries unanimously. Item number five is HBC 53611, a public hearing for possible action regarding the nomination of the Harrison House of the City of Las Vegas Historic Property Register located at 1000 F Street. Courtney? The applicant is not present. Um, you want to put it off for a couple minutes? That would be great. All right. Here, we'll put this off. Uh, the proper term is uh, trail. Trail. Trail item number five. HBC 54138 for possible action regarding the draft of phase two Huntridge Neighborhood Historic Resource Survey and inventory. Uh, Courtney? ICF International has completed the draft uh, Phase 2 Huntridge Neighborhood Survey and it is submitted for HBC review and comment with the backup with uh, today's uh, staff report. If approved, the report will be uh, submitted with any comments by the commission to the State Historic Preservation Office for review. We have a uh, uh, representative here from ICF International, Peter Maruzzi, who actually wrote the report, and he's going to give you guys a PowerPoint presentation. I'll be taking down any comments and compiling the comments that I've already received from conditioners, uh, commissioners via email uh, for Peter after the meeting. Peter, welcome, please. I'll go man the PowerPoint. Where do you want me to stand or sit? Uh, well, why don't you stand over there kind of next to that if that's comfortable with oh, you? Oh, sure, okay. And then we can kind of look at you and look at it. Right. And Peter, just let me know when you want the slide machine. I do, I'm the remote. Oh, wait, we have a remote. Yeah, have a, you can just give it to me. It'd be oh, cool. easier. Okay, yeah. We also have a uh, uh, copy of this to go along with the PowerPoint. No reading ahead. 
So I'm sure you're aware that this study has been going on. Um, my company, ICF International, uh, was granted the opportunity to do the survey, and uh, one of my colleagues and I, who my colleague isn't here, but I'm here, uh, conducted the survey in the field in January. And so since that time, and that also included uh, the research time that we used, and um, well, we did a lot of work in about four days, and so then we brought it back to the office, put it together, and uh, now you have the report. So the summary of this uh, survey is that we're focusing on track three of the 100 subdivision. Now, there, there were two other subdivisions prior to this that were, su were surveyed in 2005, so this is you know, nine years later. And the goal was to determine if there were any properties eligible for the National Range of Historic Places and whether or not the neighborhood as a whole or portions of it would appear eligible for the National Register as well. And what we delivered was the actual updated historic context that's in the report. Uh, 134 of the uh, era forms that have photographs, information about the properties, any permit information that was available uh, on forms, and color photographs indeed as well as an Excel spreadsheet of findings that was required and then the final report. So there are 134 single-family residences in, in uh, Track 3, plus Circle Park. And the construction dates were primarily 34 and 43 and 44. There were some after the war, but generally it was 43 and 44. So we had to uh, apply a context to this study. And the one that research showed made the most sense was that it was the development of FHA-approved tract housing in Las Vegas during World War II. So that's the context in which we evaluated all of these, these properties, because that is, as you do, when you read the report, you'll see how important the FHA was in this development, how important it was to be done during World War II for worker housing, and how it was an actual tract as opposed to individual parcels that were just developed by private individuals or contractors. Period of significance is the, are the years of construction, 43 to 44, and uh, the fact that they were built according to FHA guidelines. Some of the original ads for Hunt Ridge promoted defense workers as the target market. Uh, $50 rent with option to buy. Now, the thing about this ad, which you're, I'm sure, aware of from other discussions, is the concept of protective restrictions here, which, as we know, you know eliminate, limited the, number, the types of people who could live there. And this was eliminated after the 1948 Supreme Court ruling. But at the time, the FHA guidelines allowed protective restrictions, and that is how this was marketed. We found uh, a really great ad that depicted the photo, who had photographs of the Track 1 and Track 2 houses that I think really helps a lot in evaluating integrity. Because as you can see, and we'll talk about it in a minute, where's the button for the light here? Anyway, you can see on the left side, you have an open carport. And that is a key feature of these houses that were constructed during 43 and 44, because as we you probably know, almost all of them have been uh, converted into uh, living space or living rooms or whatever, they've been enclosed. So this is what the houses looked like originally. I decided that I was going to go through the entire directory for 43 and 44 because there is no actual reverse directory by address. Because there weren't that many people living in, in Las Vegas at that time, I figured, you know what, I'll just go through every single entry, and if there is a street address that is within Track 3, within the area, the survey area, I'll find out who they were and what they did for a living. So at that point, only 42% of the houses were occupied. But as you would expect, can you show me on this one? Well, it doesn't show up on that screen. It, it won't the screen. Oh, there see you go. it. There yeah. it disappears. Anyway, BMI counted for 39% of oh, basic magnesium was the primary employer of workers in Las Vegas during that period, separate from the Air Force Base and um, 
and other occupations. But second, second actually was the Union Pacific. So the railroad still had a major, uh, was still a major employer in the city uh, in 1943-44, 18%. Then the military comes next, and there are all sorts of other occupations, nurse and trucker and guard and oil business and miner and so forth. So it was a fairly broad mix of people. So even though initially the ads targeted defense workers and BMI workers, the reality was there was a lot of different kinds of people that lived there that, that were initial owners. Yeah. Let me ask you a specific question on the number 42. Is, is, this is from the phone book. Yeah. And really appreciate you going through and doing that. That's really good work on that. But is the 42, is the phone book for the, for 43, 44? Yeah, 40, it's, it's actually 43 hyphen 44. And, and so the occupancy of, how many houses were there in 43 compared to how many houses were there in 44? So 42 percent, is that a... That's a good question. Unfortunately, there weren't any original building permits available for most city. So I wasn't able to determine how many were done in 43 or how many were done in 44. Okay. There's actually no really way to know at this point. But, okay, but so. we got a good number that, that half, more than half of them were still available? Yeah, it seems like it. I mean, I don't know when these uh, directories, these phone directories were actually put together. I'm assuming they were done early in the year. So even though it says 43, 44, it might have been done January 44 or I don't know, June of 44, I don't know when. Some of the early quarters are dated April. Okay, April? Yeah. All right. So maybe it was in the latter part of 44 that the rest of the houses were sold and occupied. This is my guess, okay. but I don't know for sure. So you're, uh, I'm not sure. I, I wanted to ask how you were able to determine the occupations of the people you They actually the say. The beauty of, they're actually not phone books. They're called directories, separate from a phone book. And the beauty of directories is they actually list the occupation. Oh. It's great. It's the, one of the most helpful tools you can have when you're doing research. You can see who actually lived in these houses and how it changes over time. Okay. Yeah. This is, these were that they three out of that It was Las Vegas Tribune was the primary, uh, 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 Las Vegas was the Tribune, Morning Tribune, Las Vegas Morning Tribune also did, uh, did these for 43, 44, 45, 46. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they put them out twice a year, but they're, they're great little tools. Oh, they're amazing. And these are the, this is the titles that were actually next to them. So it actually would say fire department or accountant or service station manager, minor. I mean, these are, that's what it said in the, the directory. Guard, linotype operator, there you go. Trucker, linotype. County health department, you got one of those too. So the architectural style of, of Hunt Ridge Track 3 and pretty much all of the whole Hunt Ridge development is minimal traditional. It's a term that has come into vogue in the last 20 years. It wasn't used at the time. But it's based on the FHA's uh, Principles of Planning Small Houses that was updated in 1940. And the FHA was very specific about how houses should be designed, the minimum standards of how houses should be designed to, to qualify for uh, FHA uh, insurance, for uh, mortgage insurance. If they deviated, if the developer deviated from that, then the houses wouldn't necessarily qualify for FHA uh, insurance. Therefore, it would be a financial risk. So you have certain, here I have a list here, of what a typical Hunt Ridge minimal traditional style house had. It was, it was small, 800 to 1,000 square feet. It was one story, it was generally cross-gabled or cross-hipped roof, shallow eaves, the windows were wood frame, double hung sash, uh, generally with stucco finish, and the, the horizontal boards were usually in the gable, the gable cases. And a single bay carport with very little architectural detail. Now, what's happened since the, the mid 40s uh, is, is typical for small houses. I mean, minimal traditional houses were acceptable uh, during the war and in the early post war years, but as we know, as the years have gone by, people want bigger and bigger and bigger houses. They're not satisfied with 800 to 1,000 square feet. So they would do, they would enclose a carport, like the first thing people did. They would start adding, usually on the rear, but sometimes on the sides. They replace the wood windows. That was more, the wood window replacements more in the last 10 to 15 years, with vinyl being the most common replacement for windows. Although in the 60s and 70s, it was aluminum sliders. Um, Often stucco is reclad with a, with a thick troweled 
stuck out. Uh, porches have been enclosed. People have applied rock and brick veneers to the facades. They've covered rear patios. They've even they've constructed chimneys and fireplaces, obviously, inside living rooms. So the result is, when you evaluate these properties under the National Register criteria, A, B, and C, you have to really pay attention to integrity. And integrity is, is a key consideration because if, within the context that's been developed, if the properties don't seem to still um, meet those criteria as relates to the context, as you physically go down the street and you look at the buildings, uh, it, it's problematic. So under Criterion A, that has to do with historic associations, the, the, the essence of, of an FHA-approved war-related worker housing tract from 1943 to 44 is no longer there. When you drive down the street, it does not feel like a community of very tiny houses with open carports, uh, you know, 800, like I say, 801,000 square feet. Now, under Criterion B, which relates to important personages, it, it doesn't appear that any of the people that, you know, the 42% we saw there were people that would be considered historic personages. You know, they were generally workers. It wasn't, you know, people that were well-known. It wasn't uh, famous politicians. It wasn't, uh, you know, people who developed the strip or whatever. So we didn't find any that seemed to uh, meet the criteria for historic personages. And then finally, under Criterion C, which has to do with architectural merit, the, the additions, the uh, alterations, really have in, uh, in affected the integrity of design, materials, and workmanship. Three key elements of integrity in the National Register Bolton have been, have been lost. So, oh, and as it relates to a district, as you can imagine, the same thing occurs. You have multiple dwellings that have been substantially altered, you no longer have a neighborhood that conveys a sense of the historic environment that existed back in the war years. However, we were able to find three terrific examples of the three architectural designs that existed, that were, that were built in uh, Track 3, and that meet criteria A and C under the National Register. The first, and this is the most remarkable in my mind, is this one at Jessica Avenue, which, if you look at the picture that was uh, the early photographs that were in that ad, it has an open carport. Oop, let me go back. I mean, nobody, virtually none of the properties still have open carports, and here's one. The windows are still uh, wood frame, double hung, in this case, in a 404. The porch hasn't been enclosed. There's no, there are no additions, visible additions. It's, it's remarkable. Very good example. Of this style, and this is the second most, and this was the most numerous model, by the way. There were more of these developed uh, in track three than any other. Hello. There we go. I don't like this little. This model, even though the back of the uh, carport is blocked off, you can still see that this is a very original uh, example of this style. It, it didn't enclose the porch. So there aren't obvious, but the only addition that's, that's visible is here, and that's minimal, in my opinion. And then the third, which is not very prevalent at all, is this one. Now, this one does have an addition, a very large rear addition, that starts here, the back of the carport, and, and moves that way. But for this model, there were none others that were, were as good. So we feel that this one also meets the criteria. So, now that we've completed our work, we've evaluated the track, we really feel that these three properties should be uh, designated. And I don't know if the city does that on behalf of, no, okay. So, so I don't know exactly how you would motivate somebody to write a nomination for these properties or nominations, <clears throat> but I think they really do need uh, to be designated. What about local designation? I, you know, we didn't talk about that at all, but you know, we were asked to, to look at it for national register criteria, but I would assume that it would also meet local criteria. It does. If it, if it meets national register, it automatically meets the local. There you go. Yeah. So what we're suggesting is, uh, in addition to designating those properties, 
Instead of doing the same level of intensive survey of tracks four and five for Hunt Ridge, and also for Biltmore and Mayfair, which were similar tracks that were developed at the same time, these be done as windshield surveys. Because a windshield survey will probably will most likely confirm what we found before, which is there's a loss of integrity. You don't need to do the level of de detailed research that we did for this one to find out that most of the properties have been significantly altered. So that is our recommendation that for the next stage, you do windshield surveys of these areas, save some money in your budget, uh, verify the compromise of integrity, which we expect, but you'll still find good individual examples. And in your report, we depict a Biltmore property that is almost completely original from the war years. And in Mayfair, we found one that's very close. So there are properties there that could be easily identified in the windshield, windshield survey that would meet the criteria of the National Register. And that would encourage preservation of these terrific representatives of modest World War II housing in the city of Las Vegas. And that is my report. Question. Questions, thoughts? Yeah. Uh, does, a, um, does a windshield survey require, I mean, does that actually hire a company like yours to do that and you're just here for the morning and you know, drive up down the street? Or is that something that uh, a group of volunteers does? No, it should be done by a professional or official story. But it just doesn't require the level of research and detail. I don't know. Error? Do you say error or error? Error forms? Anyways, forms. It doesn't, you know, you may or may not need to do the forms. I would, I would suggest that you don't do the forms because I think it's rather pointless. If the properties, are, you know, don't meet any criteria because of integrity issues, why spend all the time photographing it and looking up whatever permits exist and writing up the description and doing all that? I would suggest I need to go back to the beginning. What's the goal of these surveys? What's our, what's our, what's our product that we need to produce? Is it to determine solely whether or not there are any structures there that, that would fit on, on the historic register? Or is it to write up a history of the neighborhood? What's, what's the primary goal? Or, or is, maybe ask it another way, the money, is this money that comes from the Centennial Commission, or is this from SHPO? This is SHPO. And does SHPO have rules as to what the goals are of these kinds of reports? Uh, one of their one of the goals outlined in their um, in the state historic preservation plan is to inventory maintain an inventory of historic properties. Okay. Uh, the, the reason I say it is. I always get a tremendous amount of information out of the, the first part, the, the narrative that tells me about the context of, of these neighborhoods. And even though they may have put a carport, they were still built in 1943 and 44, and, and that's valuable information as we move forward as a society, as a community, and even as a neighborhood for the value and so forth. So I don't think it's just identifying we went through 144, we have three that kind of make it that to me is almost a tangent. It's the research, and, and now we have a document for the, for that for that neighborhood. Uh, so I I would when should we've done wheelchair surveys before, and then I think we we moved into the next phase. Sometime we found there was something we wanted to. Didn't we do that with the uh, Westlake? Wesley. Yeah. Did you do a neighborhood for? Uh, I thought you did one. We hired someone. We. I, before I was hired at the city, I did the Biltmore and Mayfair, but I didn't do the entire Mayfair, um, but I did all of Biltmore. Um, but, it, but I also wanted to um, kind of build upon something, some of the goals and objectives, the question that you had about goals and objectives. Um, a lot of times when we survey neighborhoods, it's because the Neighborhood Association has, has come to us and said, we want to know if we are eligible for a designation so that we can become listed on the National Register if we're eligible. And that's kind of what, that's part, one of the things that goes into the pot with how we choose these neighborhoods um, as we, you know, as we apply for this grant funding. So it's kind of twofold. We have to maintain an inventory. We also um, want to provide that service for the public. Um, we also want to keep it, you know, create a historical record of the history of the neighborhood as well as the homes. Um, and if, you know, if they are eligible, then we can assist them with moving forward with a designation. 
Does the windshield survey will it provide us the same sort of in-depth background on the neighborhood, or will it only say eh, no? Can I can I just interject? Please. You can have a windshield survey that is accompanied by a very detailed context. The same level of research that goes to the context can still be accomplished in the relational forms, all the individual forms that very time consuming. To, to, with a result, like you say, that, well, okay. It doesn't qualify for anything. We have a nice photograph of them, we have a description of them, we have the written permits. So that part of the, the survey, which takes a lot of time, could, not, could be pushed aside and just identified as an Excel spreadsheet. But still do the context. So the other question I had is, is more maybe as the Department of Interior guidelines you're looking at the structure and what's occurred to the structure. And so when I drive through that neighborhood, I get the feeling 43, 44. The streets are narrow, they're different sized streets. It's, it's not just that particular house, it's when you look at it from an aerial view, the design of that, that hundreds neighborhood, that's still there. Those streets are still there. The, the lot size is still there. The front yard for almost all of those is identical the way it was back in 43, but it seems we limit ourselves into what's been done with this structure as opposed to what's been done with the neighborhood. Is that the Department of the Interior rules and regs that, that require yes. only to focus on the building, or are we focusing on the neighborhood? Because we're the same well, neighborhood. Well, I mean, I, 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 cause I knew your thoughts on this issue before we came here, so I looked it up to make sure I knew what I was talking about. And when you're when you're evaluating for a district, when you're talking about a district, because otherwise it would be individual buildings. When you're when you're evaluating a district, <clears throat> it has to retain all the things that you said. It's you know, it's layout, the street, the, the, how wide they were, the sidewalks, all that. But the the individual buildings also have to retain integrity. Okay. You can't just um, according to the regulations, you can't designate something as a district for those just those things that you said. Unfortunately, you can't. Is there a weighting? No, it's not that specific, but it's fairly clear that if there's a, you know, a serious issues with the integrity of the, the contributors, I mean, you have to have contributors to a district, and if very few of them would qualify, then you have a district of no contributing properties. You can't really do that. And yeah, we did find in Beverly Green, and we found in various parts of Beverly Green, and et cetera, that we do have great integrity in the majority of the houses. And pointed out with the ERAs the, uh, the difference between the, the non-conforming and the conforming. Yeah, and generally 50% is sort of the cutoff. If you can find half the properties in the district boundaries that appear eligible or contribute, then you have enough to constitute a district. And that's pretty generous. I mean, half of them not, you know. Half so in, in light of what Bob was saying, because I consider these historic districts, although not uh, historic neighborhoods, although they don't have any kind of designation at the moment, and, and we're saying that this isn't eligible for designation. Uh, I, we still consider them that. I mean, I'm still selling them that way, and the buyers are looking for them because of that. Sure. But we don't have any other word that says historic but not historic. You know? Yeah, well, you don't have to get that specific. You don't have to say, this is a historic neighborhood by the opinion of the real thing industry. However, the National Register is not a historic <laughs> district. Okay. I mean, nobody really cares. If, if you say this is a historic neighborhood, in fact, it was built in 43, 44, no one's going to dispute it. They're going to say, well, it's not historic because the National Register doesn't apply. Yeah. No one's going to know that. But how can we take this information and that it actually can leave this room and be disseminated to the homeowners in this district that says, this is the ideal of what these homes looked like back then. And if you really, really want to improve your value, if you really want to, can they come? Can they come into compliance? I mean, could a well, homeowner? Sure. I mean, it would be expensive the probably. house, and ideally, I mean, we'd love to have to do that instead sure. of, you know, putting another new bird front on it. Or most homeowners don't like to reduce their square footage, though. Okay. I mean, I found. But they could. They could do more to do the look. Yeah, the carport's a big deal. Um, you have to, you know, Let me ask you the question, right now, my last question on this, and, and, and that is a twofold question. Mm -hmm. Sure. And, and that is, if we had gone, instead of 43-44, we had taken 43 through 46, 
you think that would have made a difference, or were you able to determine? And the second part of that is maybe one question: is was the carport the the, the 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 first biggest thing people did, or was it other things they modified the house? Was that was it closing the carport or the first standard thing? You know, we need more space. You know, I have a child. We want to do it. Or were you able to tell what the first? We were able to tell, and it was the carport. Okay. And it was almost immediately after the war. So you know, one could make an argument if you change the context and said FHA approved housing during the war and a little bit after the war, but it just seems awkward because the reason the whole development, the whole track development was done was for worker housing during the war. If you keep going beyond the war, where do you stop? You can stop at 46, 49, 52. Well, that's what it is. They were basically saying, you know, this is a wonderful neighborhood, a wonderful place to live in. But we need to close a car for it. Yeah, good reasons for it. I'm sure. And, and, and uh, so if 70% of them were done within a year or two years after the war, I can almost say we got two phases, 43, 44, and then 45, whatever. But, Anyway, well, speaking of the carport, though, I mean, architecturally, they were literally almost designed to be filled in. I mean, they were under the roof of the house. Yeah, the attic right. space extended out over the right. the carport there it is, okay? okay. Uh, I, I mean, it, the basic look was, yeah, let's do this during the war, but we built a house that you can expand easily. Well, we didn't find any evidence that that was their intention. I mean, if, if we had found any document that says, we expect after the war that you're going to fill in this carport. Then we would have said, well, the carport it, it expands or it, uh, enclosure doesn't matter. Okay. Because they were designed to be that way. That's but we okay. never saw anything that ever said, because mm -hmm. they were following the FHA guidelines. And right. you know, the carport was supposed to be minimal. It was supposed to be minimal. So there was never any. You know, but if they really wanted to be minimal and they were really saving costs during the war and building housing. Uh, you, they could have built the house with an aluminum patio with an aluminum carport cover on it. I mean, that didn't have to take all the the, the most of being construction and FHA, everything extended over the carport. I don't think the FHA though guidelines would have allowed that. There are specific materials. I don't think they ever allowed aluminum or, or even a flat roof patio cover or made out of wood. Yeah, I I, I don't know for sure, but I didn't see that. The question then I want to give is is. Let's say we're, we're, I, I suspect we probably will approve. Or, or we have an action item on this. Yes. Suspect that we will approve with the, the recommended changes. What if all of a sudden Peter finds as he's going through and doing other work that document says FHA says pl plan two is we're going to fill in the carports. Can we come back and say we want to now reestablish this as a historic neighborhood? Well, can we come back and amend it? I guess if you can amend what the historic register, you must be fine to do that. Well, why would you, I mean, you, wouldn't yeah. you just go ahead and head, try to designate it with the condition that the uh, enclosure doesn't matter, and that the enclosure is acceptable? You don't need a whole separate yeah. study yeah. to do yeah. that. Do you, do you think the fact that only less than 40% were even occupied takes away from the, con the context? Looking at it as an FHA, you know, for the war effort, you know, there was this alleged. Uh, I, I I studied this area pretty closely, so I, I kind of have a, a feel for it. You, looking, at, I think you made the right choice in looking at it in that context. But at the time, I don't think Las Vegas saw it as a housing track that the FHA FHA is providing. They just saw it as, man, there's another housing track over on the other side of Charleston. That's how, I mean, that's how they saw it. And by looking at it through that one context, it doesn't seem, it seems like it should be 100% occupied. I mean, it, it, you know what I mean? I mean well, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't quite jive. And to me, it's more important just as a, just a, it's a yet another place that Las Vegas expands rather than whether it meets a specific criteria or not. Well, see, the thing, the 4344 uh, date of the 43% occupancy only has to do with the fact that the directory came out early in 44. Had the directory come out like in December of 44, right. most likely it would have been 100% occupancy. So, or, yeah, most likely it would have been 100% occupancy considering how much housing was necessary. So the, the number is so small only because the directory came out early. 
in 44. And that's where your data could come from. So that's the only right. data you had for that kind of And we don't have the original building permits, so we can't prove what years that exactly right. they were completed. Yeah, yeah. it just seems like I understand the need to, to have a context to look at. I understand. But it just seems like by doing that, we've limited how we approach it. I mean, it limits how we look at it. You know, we really struggled with the context. It, you don't want to appear arbitrary when you're doing a context. And by adding years to it, I, I, how do you justify it? Because, again, how do you cut it off? 46, 48, 52, 51? Hmm. I mean, you don't. It's... But the 43, 44 makes sense because that's when they were all designed and built. Boom. Right. And they were finished. I mean, I mean, I might have looked at it in the context of what it meant to the valley. You know, what it meant. I might have extended it up to like 1950, but, you know, but I'm not, I'm not uh, practiced in this type of thing. But, I mean, just okay, let me ask you a question a different way, Courtney. Suppose we said, you know what, this is great. In 43, 44, all the papers they have, those both about carries. And then we really want to have a better understanding of this neighborhood in the, uh, up to uh, up to the Korean War, the, the, the post-war years. We could certainly fund that, could we not? In fact, what the commission voted to continue the survey with tract four, four, right next year. What we're thinking is instead and this is based partly on um, Peter's recommendations, is that we complete the entire Huntridge neighborhood with more of a windshield survey, survey and possibly adding in um, a, re, a, a relook at the Mayfair and Biltmore surveys under the FHA context so that we have, it's more of a, what we might call a, 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 an overall FHA context or something where we would look at all of the homes. And that, I think, would, would expand that period of significance slightly. Maybe, you know, within the past 50 years, we can look at how the, the neighborhoods have changed and grown and, and maybe look at some of the patterns of changes, like patterns of carport enclosures and okay. things okay. like that. And then we can, ha once we have this context, when neighborhoods come to us um, looking for designation, we kind of have a set of guidelines on how to approach looking at their integrity or, uh, you know, their overall integrity. And then at that point, we can start looking at more detailed stuff for those properties if we need to. But this is, and actually the National Trust, um, I'm sorry, the National Register came out with a recommendation last year where they, they're, they're thinking that for these track developments that we do start moving into more of a windshield survey type of approach because we're not necessarily, our goals are not necessarily to document the condition of each home and, you know, these giant six or seven or eight page forms that we have but that they're looking, they want more of a context that will be more beneficial to the public when they want to pursue designation and also beneficial to us because now we're gathering these great histories of these neighborhoods as opposed to focusing on each home. So I think we're starting in general to move towards that, that method. Any other comments? No, I agree that that's a, a, a great approach for us to go. It saves money. Well, yeah, because we're not, I mean, we have like three, mo if we have like, like in, in this last survey with the three models, we really need to document the ones that have integrity because that's going to help us the most realize what they used to look like, you know, if we don't have images or whatever. Um, and we can say, here's, and we can do a, you know, 10 page form for those, those three models. And then the rest of them are just, you know, basically documented on a spreadsheet and we'll get more bang for the buck. We can cover more area and focus on the context. Yeah, you can take the same amount of money and put a lot more of it in the context, more of what you're talking about. Expand the, the period that you're evaluating everything with the same amount of money. So we're looking at a change of scope, I should just mention this now, for the 2014 um, uh, SHPO grant so that we can do more of a, more of a, um, a windshield survey and um, get more, cover more area. Courtney, just my last uh, thing is, uh, uh, look for a motion to approve, but we are only approving the report, not his recommendation. Correct. Correct. Okay. Correct. Uh, that will come later on as we change this potential change. Right. And it seems to me that we don't have in all five phases of Humphreys, because all of Humphreys was a, a, a single unit in itself, even though they were built in phases, and, and I'd really love to see, like, you know, Track the, the, the building pattern that they use. Just I, I probably could do that myself with the, the 
the tax records. And, but uh, and until we put it all together, because there are pockets where there's a great deal more integrity than there is in other pockets. And I think we did this first because the, this one that we put, decided on a year or two ago to do this one was because this was probably the shabbiest pocket of, okay. I think we um, were just going in order of track mm -hmm. development. But we arbitrarily divided them into five sections. No, no, they were no. actually they were that's, that's, five why, segments. that's why that very second slide showed when it was platted. It was track three. Okay. All right. So that, 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 that's the five segments. Mm -hmm. Specific boundaries. Right. And we've done one two, so we're going to three. But I think when we put them all in together, we're going to have much more in, 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 in properties with integrity that. That they can apply to the entire district because we don't have to just do number three as this one's eligible, but number five isn't. Yeah, what is the scope of year? 43 to 43, 44 is track three. Mm -hmm. so all five tracks. 42 through, I guess, the end of the war. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, so <laughs> all five tracks were built during the war. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Okay, look for a motion. Move to approve the survey. I'll second. For the discussion. From the audience. Hearing none. All those in favor say aye. And aye. aye. Motion carried. That's great. Thank you. Thank really you. look forward to uh, the to, uh, uh, report. We're now on uh, HPC 54139, possible act regarding the request for HPGs and Daniel Legacy Fund for structural analysis of the gun club at Floyd Glen and Tooley Springs. Courtney. The gun club uh, building at Floydland Park at Tule Springs was constructed in 1954 at the northwest corner of the developed area within the park. It is a brick ranch style building with a carport and partially covered patio with seating. And there were trap houses that are located adjacent to the building. I'm not certain if those trap houses that exist there are the original trap houses. I couldn't find any information on that. Um, while I'm talking, uh, I'm going to pass this around too. These are some of the uh, RJ and uh, various articles that were found about the gun club with some of the older pictures. Sorry, Flynn. No. Skip <laughs> Flynn right by. Um, the original developers were William Moore, that's supposed to be junior, not juror, uh, J.K. Housel, senior, and uh, the contractors were Joseph Wells and C.D. Stewart. Businessman Whitey Shugart and Cliff Devaney and resort operator P.J. Gomond, uh, restaurateur, uh, Jean McLean and Joe Ber Berge, or Bergey, uh, who managed the club. And there were two unnamed Los Angeles businessmen that also held shares. Um, 2010, the Clark County Shooting Range ended their lease on the property, so the building's been vacant since that time. And due to the condition of the building, the City of Las Vegas Operations and Maintenance and Park and Recreation Departments have expressed concerns for the safety of park visitors should anyone attempt to enter the building. They're recommending demolition of the building and the associated structures. Staff received a proposal from historical structural engineer Melvin Green to provide a structural analysis of the building. And staff is requesting $6,000 from the HBC Centennial Legacy Fund, uh, the operating expenses to fund this analysis. And if approved, Mr. Green would begin the analysis as soon as possible. And attached is his proposal as well as images of the gun club building. Yeah. Courtney, I assume that you, you would be bringing the board unless you thought there was some opportunity. Well, how this was initiated was the, the Operations and Maintenance Department and the Parks and Recreation Department uh, called me. Um, they expressed the concerns about demolishing it, and I felt that because it's listed uh, on, in the uh, historic district that we should... Um, have an analysis done to make sure to determine whether or not it is still structurally sound or unsound so that we can come to you and say yes it's structurally unsound uh, it, it's not necessarily part of the the historic ranch context only because it's uh, 10 years you know later after it was constructed then we can start talking about whether or not it needs to be demoed or saved I understand there's a a bar in there that's like a wood carved bar that came from someplace else that is the bar itself is apparently historic. I haven't been in there to see it. Um, but, you know, so that would might be something that we could pull out if we decide to, to move forward with demolition. Um, but I'd like to see, you know, 
if it's sound or not. We've got the rumor in here, the Donor Club Bar. No. Is that the rumor? I, I agree with Courtney. I, I have a problem with when something isn't, the first thing that we say is tear it down. Just get rid of it. So let's have the structure checked out to see if possibly it's worth saving. If it isn't, then, you know, I, I'm for it. But I have a problem with, okay, let's get rid of this. You know, and it's part of history. I guess. If, it, if it can be saved, it should be saved. Yeah. The, the, the survey. Is, is there a, a, a use for it? Is there a purpose that, uh, that could be put to, to good use as part of the park and part of the attraction as we want people to come to the park? And right. One of the ideas, or a couple of ideas that we've, we've talked about is having a space for um, uh, snacks and water and that kind of thing. Um, we could also really expand this into uh, a, a place for people to rent to have larger parties because there is an industrial kitchen apparently in the in the building, um, as opposed to the visitor center, which has just like the microwave and um, you know a fridge and running water. So this might be might, this could possibly replace the, the the function of the cookhouse that burned by being able to have larger parties. So I'll make a motion that we uh, get a structural <coughs> survey or a structural review to determine um, the status of the property, and then we can move from there. Second. Okay. We have a motion. We have a second for the discussion. Uh, the six thousand is coming from the HBC Centennial Legacy Budget. Okay. This is and when we have that and then spending just six thousand and then interfering with some other proposals or requests or I that we'd like to consider. Right. It it does not interfere. Okay. It's part of the, the larger operating expenses. This is the one with lots of cash in it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Comments from the audience? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, those opposed, motion carries unanimously. I'd like to move back to item number five, HPC 536111, a public hearing for possible action regarding the nomination of the Harrison House to the City of Las Vegas Historic Property Register located at 1000 F Street. Courtney? The Historic Preservation Officer has reviewed the attached nomination report for 1001 F Street and supports the determination of eligibility to the City of Las Vegas Historic Property Register. Um, if designated on the City of Las Vegas Historic Property Register, the HPC will be responsible for reviewing any work requiring a permit for the building. Um, if approved, the nomination for designation will be forwarded to the Las Vegas Planning Commission for consideration at the July 8, 2014 meeting. And if approved there, the uh, Las Vegas City Council meeting, it will be scheduled for uh, City Council on August 20, 2014 for final action. There is a 10-day appeal period following City Council. I'm Catherine Duncan, and I'm just so delighted that uh, this commission especially is taking up Harrison House as an item to help us preserve this precious landmark that is so means so much to the um, African American community as a way to have a physical location to come and learn about the uh, tremendous contributions that African Americans have made to our great state. Especially during our 150th birthday, we've um, designed some celebrations to talk about the role that African Americans have played in the state of Nevada, all the way from the Emancipation Proclamation to the current time. Harrison House also is a place where people can come who just want to talk about race and racism, which has been a hot topic in America, and we find a lot of people just uncomfortable talking about race. Uh, I get so many people come to me, especially Caucasian people, ask me, well, what do you want to be called anyway? Do you want to be Negro or colored or black or African American? So people have these, this um, need to be able to do what's uh, proper, and then we also need to have a place where we can just hug and love one another to get rid of some of the um, deep-seated racial issues that we have. We're also calling for uh, reconciliation and healing 
from the negative aspects of slavery. So all of this is going on at Harrison House. Today, unfortunately, we did get kind of a mix-up because you put a big sign in front of our building to be here at 1 o'clock. So are we at the wrong meeting at the wrong time or uh, just not sure? <laughs> well, we got a big old poster in front of the house that says, be here at 1 o'clock today. So we're here, we're sorry, we're late, but we thought we were early. Save the poster, it's your story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I'm hoping that um, we can at least today, I'm, I don't know all the process, even though I served on this commission, we would just like to at some point be recognized by the city of Las Vegas as a historic landmark. The mayor already gave us a proclamation saying that we're historic. The report has been done. So we could get listed on the city's register of historic places. We could move forward and our financing would be able to fund if we could have this body recognize Harrison House as a historic landmark. Look for a motion. So moved. Do we have a second? Second. Yeah. Well, motion from Commissioner Bellins, a second from Commissioner Mellon Arnold. What is it that, that we are going to put the Harrison House on the city of Las Vegas to start registering? Uh, any comment from the commission? But who's that is the, the owner of it? The owner of the house is the Ward 5 Chamber of Commerce. It's a nonprofit 501c6 organization, and we've owned the house since 2009. I'm, I put my personal funds into the house back in, in 2008 and then turned it over to the Chamber of Commerce so they could develop it. It's a nice tax write off for you. Right. <laughs> Any further questions from the Commission? David? Uh, just a real quick one. We, last time we made a few minor suggestions to Mella's report. Mm -hmm. But that was incorporated? Not in this one. The, the draft that was included it, uh, that you reviewed for the, the, yeah. uh, at the last meeting yeah. had to be forwarded to this meeting. It had to be the same document. Okay. And we were able to publish Mellon Harmon's report in our Harrison House report, and this was distributed to um, over 400 people on March 26th. So let me get, uh, I, I think, you know, what I went through here, there was a couple of the same small issues that we have with the with the one that went to the to the state. Is there a way that the motion can include any corrections that were made at the final document? Sure. I include the to include the motion. My motion is to include those corrections made on the final document. Okay. Does that work? Yeah, I think it does. And I believe those corrections have actually been made already. We just we just could not include that version with this staff report because we had to include the same version that was submitted for your review last month. Gotcha. I bet. Gotcha. Okay. Right. Any further comments from the uh, general public? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. <coughs> aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Does not go to the city council? Planning commission and then city council. Planning commission. I think you're on your way. Thank you very much. <laughs> and if we can be excused, we'll get next Congratulations <laughs> on your recent uh, award for all the work you've done uh, it was such a great honor to be presented that award in front of the mayor and city council. It gave our organization another blessing. So thank you so much. Apologize for the sign. It's a great sign. <laughs> Everybody in the neighborhood got a boy, something's really going on. Save that sign. Save that sign. Uh, item number eight. For possible act regarding possible amendments to the First Amendment <laughs> of the amended and uh, restated memorandum of understanding between the City of Las Vegas, the Taylor Commission, and the City. That item description one of the all time great sentences, by the way. Regarding mm -hmm. possible amendment to the amendment to the amendment. <laughs> to the understanding. <laughs> Restated. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Courtney, help us. Okay. On September 28th in 2011, the HBC voted to approve fund reallocations, which included eliminating the awards fund category and including awards in operating expenses, and then increasing the small grant fund amount to $25,000. Currently, the Centennial Legacy Budget is divided between the Operating Fund and the Small Grant Fund. The Operating Fund has uh, $62,856 remaining, and the Small Grant Fund has zero balance. Currently, there's no language in either the amended and restated memorandum uh, MOU uh, between the Commission, the Las Vegas Centennial Commission, and the City, 
or the First Amendment to the amended and restated MOU between the Commission for the City, or Commission for the Centennial and the City in 2013, which would allow the HBC to reallocate funds from one category to another. Staff is scheduled to submit an update on HBC Centennial Legacy projects, a current budget, and an amendment to the First Amendment for consideration at the July meeting of the uh, Las Vegas Centennial Commission to include bricks and mortar grants as an allowable grant pot project per uh, the HBC vote a few months ago. The amendment also allocates $25,000 for small grant funds and the remainder for the operating fund. Staff recommends adding additional language to that amendment that would allow the HBC to replenish the small grant fund to $25,000 each year during that first grant cycle. If approved, the HPO will work with the Office of the City Attorney to draft the language and submit directly to the Commission for this, uh, Las Vegas Centennial for consideration. And just, just to give you some, uh, the reasoning behind that is because, because staff can't administer, uh, you, you know, if, if, if the HBC has the power to move funds from the operating expense, uh, operating expense to the small grant fund, uh, then there will be kind of ad infinitum grants and since staff cannot uh, administer, um, you know, an, an um, endless amount of grants, we would like to limit the number of grants. And we think that this will replenish, will serve two purposes. We'll replenish that, that funding every year into the, the $25,000. So you'll have $25,000 to give out to the small grant funds. But it also limits, it still limits the, the number of grants based on the amount that can be given. So it kind of helps the commission and staff meet both goals. How many grants do you give out? Well, the, the regular grants, uh, the non-bricks-and-mortar grants are limited to a $5,000 max, so that would be five if you gave out all five. The bricks-and-mortar grants allow for, they have a $2,500 match required, but we're only going to be doing one of those a year just because of, of how labor-intensive they are for staff. So we're going to say a max five, maybe, per year. Five per year would take, that's a $5,000 a grant. Right. So that would take care of the $25,000. Right. So if we, I'm sorry, so if we give five grants at the beginning of the year, and then later towards the end of the year, we can't decide that somebody else needs a grant because we're out of money. And we have no way to get okay. So help me put that in context for me. We were getting $75,000 a year from the Centennial Commission. We were not getting 75000 a year. We got $75,000, which we spent the majority of, and then we requested an additional 75000 the commission has said that we need to spend that money before we can get another seventy-five thousand dollars. Let me put another one. If we were to spend seventy-five thousand dollars a year, the Centennial Commission would be giving us that money. Correct. And the challenge is that we there's only so many projects. It's not necessarily the amount of money we get. Well, I guess it would be if it's a small project or large project. It's more the number of projects that your office, and I'm using the word office, that your office can handle a year, and that's five or six, as you, as you said. That's still a lot. Okay. That's a lot. I mean, and then, and then in addition to other projects that might come out of the operating expenses, it would be a full load. So the project we just approved with, uh, with the 100 phase two, you, if you had five of those a year, that would be a lot. <laughs> that would be a lot. Okay. I mean, that would be, <laughs> that would be, okay. So give me a, give, so we've got a sense. You're talking jumping in front of a bus a lot. <laughs> yeah. So that's jumping in front of a that. bus. Yeah. Which one jumping in front of a tricycle? Which yeah, one, I know. The small one that doesn't Child take any, any time. Well, give me an example. So we've got some. Because all projects are not considered the same. No. Um, it's very difficult to, it, it, that's a difficult question to answer because it, it also depends on the skill level of the, the individuals that you're working with. Some of them require a little bit more um, um, interaction than others. 
I, I'm hesitating to just ask for the 25000 Is that all we can ask for? No, you can certainly ask for more. But whether or not we would be able to administer it is, a, is another question. This $25,000 goes to bricks and mortars, or is this for our other little grants that we give to people? It's come both. Come in here and write up their proposals and et cetera, et cetera. It's both. So we asked for $25,000 plus forty more thousand to fund an assistant for you. Uh, every, you're the only one not smiling on that. The two people on both sides are smiling like, Is there some rule? I don't that even we know if that's possible. That? I mean where does I mean Esther Carter is funded through that. Can we not find I mean for us we have to limit to say we're only gonna do five projects a year because you don't have the help. I mean there's some sort of mission I think right now the Centennial Commission is going to push to spend a, a more money than it has in past years. And we're now going to ask them for less money. And this is Historic Preservation Commission. I guess I mean, there's only so many projects that you can handle. Uh, but I don't think the Centennial Commission is going to leave a whole bunch of money <coughs> doing nothing. I think this Centennial Commission wants to move and do stuff. Uh, I was hoping we could be a little more a part of that. Well, I mean, we can also like, increase, sense. can we increase the amount of, of the grants? I mean, we could possibly ask for the um, 7,500 rupees for each one or whatever, you know. I mean, our limit is just the $5,000, but I'm sure like the Harrison House or something like that would. But that doesn't help. I, I move out of favor of that. Okay. Yeah. But that's not helping her. The issue is that their office, or her office. Her. Her office, <laughs> and her office can only hand cannot handle five reviews a year. Because that's basically what you're at working with people and helping them write their proposals because it gets into a whole lot of other stuff and I understand the qualifications of people because she ends up probably writing half of whatever it is they, they submit. I'm just saying, you know. So we're looking for somebody to assist her. So can we not put that as part of our commission or something? Like we have an assistant that goes in to assist her or something? You know, the worst thing that will, will, will occur is the Centennial Commission will yell at us. That's the worst thing well, that will occur. Well, it happened to yell at us just as long as it doesn't appear that, that Courtney is the one that uh, is... Well, right. that's why I said her office. I mean, if, 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 if that person is either attached to the commission as a, an assistant to work with her office, then it's not necessarily her specifically, but she's attached to an aide or a historic assistant or something that works with the commission. You see what I'm doing, Mommy? And who basically age, aids that office. I, uh, can I take Courtney off the of hospital for a second and put the director of planning on it for a moment? Yeah. Uh, is, is, there, is there a path? Do you see a path of where we're trying to go or is already I, I, I kind of see this as being reversed. You're, you're looking at adding a position to handle projects you don't have yet. Right. Okay. I, I think you need to determine what projects you want to pursue and then outline a path to achieve those projects. Okay, I get that, but the path that we've been presented with is limiting the number of projects, so it seems to be already a decision has been made to say we're only going to handle these, these number, as opposed to saying, well, we to do, we'd like to do uh, three, four, and five, we want to get these done in the next 24 months. Uh, and I'm not sure that Courtney could take on another project to come up with a plan that I think would make your success. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's almost like we're, I don't think anybody is opposed that thinks that this commission spends money willy-nilly, uh, nor do I think the Centennial Commission that does that, but there's a, there's a change in the wind. Clearly, the Centennial Commission at the last meeting reduced the amount of money it's going to keep in its back pocket to, I think, 250000 or is it 500? 
I, I think it was two fifty. Was it two hundred fifty thousand? And it was keeping at least three, if not four times that much money. So there, there's more money that's going to be available, and, and so I, we don't have another meeting. We have to do something in this meeting, so you've got something to present to the July meeting, correct? Because we have correct. another meeting in between. Not, not uh, so that I would have time to get it together for the July meeting. It has to go through the city attorney's office and at several layers of review. What kind of help do you need? Uh, I'm trying to get your, do you need help up front with grant writing or do you help on the end of it looking at what's going out in the field, what's being constructed? Uh, well, it depends on the project. It's really just, I mean, <clears throat> my, my official title, I know this is going to shock you all, is Urban Design Coordinator. And we, I do have a percentage of that time that has to go towards urban design projects. And right now it's, it's really heavily weighted on historic preservation projects. And that, that sort of, we need to find a better balance of that. Um, and so I may actually have a little bit less time to spend on this than I would normally. So it's, it's hard to say what, I, what exactly I need help with um, without looking at specific grant projects. But you know, an assistant would be great. But then, then I, I would also be spending a lot of time, kind of managing that assistant as well. So um, it's it's hard. It's a really hard question without sitting down and really thinking about all of the options. And I think part of the problem is we don't know what grant projects we're going to receive, what types of applications we're going right. to receive. I mean. Harrison House is an example of one that came forward to us, and you know there are others out there. And as Courtney has mentioned, different types of applications require different amounts of staff time, depending on on how much coaching or assistance the applicant may need. Um, and so it's really difficult to say without knowing exactly. Do those grant applications come to you first, or do we get them? They, they come, come to me you. first, right? So you could have grant applications sitting there that you haven't been able to get to. That no, as soon as they come in, they're scheduled. We, we have the two so cycles per year. So we've seen all grant applications. Correct. Requests. And we've been the passive. If they come in, as opposed to us going out and looking in the neighborhood and saying, hey, we suggest you come in and ask for a grant because we've got this massive staff and a million dollars. Come on, come on, come on. And we have a limited number. We've got a limited number of staff. Well, I would suggest that one process could be that you go ahead, that we would approve this, and it goes on the Centennial's agenda. And then what the Centennial Commission does at that point, somebody could move to make a motion uh, uh, to do something else. Because not every, not every motion, not everything on the agenda gets approved, approved in its entirety. So something something could change if everybody was in agreement that we there's a, there was an answer that we wanted to propose in July 28th. Yeah, if Chairman, if I may, if yeah. there if the changes to the agreement, if there are changes to the agreement uh, as posted, and those change if if there are changes to agreement, and those changes are not significant. No, significantly different than as posted in a substantive basis, then yeah, you, you, would, you could amend the agreement. But if it went from $25,000 to $125,000 for a new uh, staff for the Department of Planning, <coughs> the Department of Planning uh, that might be such a significant change to the contract that the, the lawyer that sits with the Taylor Commission might, might raise that as an issue. So yes, the answer to your question is yes. Changes can be made if people think it's a good idea. Uh, the, the larger and more substantive the change, uh, there might have to be something done between that next meeting, the next Centennial meeting, and the one following to make sure that we follow all the open meeting law rules. Basically, what I'm saying is for the next year, we're talking about twenty-five thousand dollars. during that period of time that the Centennial Commission is truly going to be more active and really wants to be involved in the community and wants, to, wants to, to do these kinds of things. And now we're saying that it's the city's agency, the Historic Preservation Commission, the 
why not ask for more money? Without, why not ask for more money without getting into the whole issue of staffing? Because that's a real headache for everybody trying to add, trying to work out how to add staff and just ask for more money and then deal with it down the road. I mean, and, and on that, when we ask for more money, it, the gentleman that was here earlier making the uh, presentation on the uh, Huntridge yeah, we could hire a consultant to handle some of this too. I mean, we've got, you know, if we've got a project that's worth doing, we'll throw the money for it, and we need help, we could get a consultant that can come up to speed quickly. Obviously, you know, there he stands. There he stands. Mm -hmm. stands. I was copying, so I don't like we're, we're talking about. You. So we could hire a consultant to come in and, and handle some portion of this project. And then the consultant goes away and it's done. You know, I, I think that the people on the Centennial could go and speak for all of them. But uh, are clearly going to be open to to a discussion of the issue. And, and there may not be, and maybe if the result is 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 the twenty five thousand. I mean, whatever the number is, the number of projects seem to be the the, the bigger dictator. The time and, and if more of your time is going to be going away from from your, your uh, ship overall, or your secondary role of your historic preservation officer, that provides a challenge. And, and this city, I mean, everybody around the table knows this city is not afraid and they're very supportive of, of historic projects when, when they, you know, I was going to say when they have a, a, a value, but I mean, what is the Fifthry School or whatever, or West Side School, obviously. Uh, there's a lot of things. So the city is not afraid to, to do that. I, I, Courtney, I, uh, uh, what, what's your thoughts on it? Is there a direction we want to see we get to ask for more money? What would, what would they, uh, then that would bring the discussion up. Would you, you know, Courtney would say, well, I would only read 25,000 with the bozos on the APC. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> that was too aggressive shaking your head. Yeah. <laughs> That's how it worked. It's not a saying. <laughs> I was in the head. Yeah. Nothing to do with the substance at all. <laughs> you know, I think one of the concerns that we've had is, you know, SHPO funds in the future. It's been questioned, what will we receive in the future from SHPO? Um, do we have any additional surveys that we'd like to do in the pipeline? Is that something that, again, as, as Commissioner Hotchkiss has brought up, that rather than looking to SHPO for funding for future surveys, what we might do is include that as a potential project in addition to the $25,000 that we want for the small grants. Um, again, just thinking strategically about what are the projects we would like to accomplish over the next year and maybe putting some additional funding in that request for those types of projects. I think we would need to be specific as we go before the Centennial Commission and say this is what the money is going to be used for. Uh, so we would have to identify that up front, but I'm just wondering, Courtney, if what is next on our list of projects? Uh, well, if, well, for SHPO projects, we have um, possibly we have to revise the scope for next year, so we might be doing a, a larger windshield survey. Um, we are going to be looking at the Gun Club building. I'd have to look at this. I don't know that the HPC has identified um, anything to move forward with at this point. Possibly Huntridge. Well, we do want to finish up. How many left for the Huntridge? I mean, uh, theater. I'm sorry. Oh, the yeah. theater. Um, I mean, there's any number of things. I can, look at, I can look at this list and pick out something that we can spend money on for every single one of these, you know, projects on here, for every single one of these buildings. And we also developed that list of, of projects that uh, for for Whitney to look at, um, and we could start working on most of those as well. There's just a lot of stuff. There's a, there's infinite number of projects. I think that the Centennial Commission is going to be looking to the HPC for thoughts and advice and those, and those kinds of things. The question is, is how much time is it? What, the, Will you be able to take five of those, put a, put a reasonable number attached to them, and run it through the city attorney's office or, or, or through the director of planning in time for the July 29th meeting? Can you, if we decided to take, what's that for $100,000? 
I'm not sure. I, I, I mean, I, I would not feel comfortable just picking five projects out without coming to the HBC without, you know, for, for feedback on those projects. So we got two rocks in a hard place. <laughs> Uh, is there any kind of way that I, I kind of like Bob's idea about the money using for consultants so that if we get the consultant who puts the whole package together I know it's going to take time for you to review it I'm not saying that but what it does is it cuts down on or if we have a consultant for somebody who's turned in a grant that needs assistance with writing that grant or researching that grant, and we have a consultant. So this takes some of that off of their slate, but we're paying. So we're asking for money. The money so much is to be able to hire consultants to uh, uh, assist with our our future projects. So if we have five, if we select five, or we select six. We're asking for additional funds, not just to whatever you, we do with that $5,000, but also to pay a consultant, you know, to work with these projects. So to me, that sounds, I mean, if I'm out of it, then tell me, because to me, that sounds like a, a, a solution. Planning department? It's a solution for certain <laughs> projects, for sure. Uh -huh. It can be a solution for certain projects. For certain projects. So, so when I would suggest this, here's, here's the process that would need to, to take place. There's going to be a meeting on July the 28th. Right. Okay. They are likely going to be within the city of Las Vegas. They're going to want to have that to Esther by at least July the 18th. They're going to want it ahead of time so they can walk around and do whatever they do. So that means that we would have to call a special meeting of the HPC with the sole purpose of giving you advice on those five projects that you don't want to just arbitrarily put up that you would want us to, to give your input on at least by July the, the, the 10th. So this is now June what? No, we're not. Are we in the June? No. May 28th. We're May 28th. So that would get, is six weeks enough time for you to, to come up with that kind of a thing? Is that is that more than, you know, I don't know what your schedule is, your holidays, your you know, vacation, or what's going on with, with everything else you've got on your plate? Um, I'm not clear what the direction is. So we have a meeting, an HBC meeting in June. Right. So would that item be, would there be an item on the agenda that pit, that prioritizes five projects that then would be moved forward as part of the approved budget for, because we have not, the commission has not spent the money. We have 60 some thousand dollars in here that we have not spent yet. So the five projects could come from that $60,000 without going to the Centennial Commission, as long as it meets the very kind of liberal definition uh, of projects that we've provided for in the approved budget already. So we have 63 some to spend before they're going to give us another pot of funding. So, when the, so let's assume that at the June meeting that we say money spent, we're going to do it and we're going to spend this. Are we going to have to then go to the July 28th meeting of the Centennial Commission with a whole new list? Because I don't remember us ever going to them with a specific list of things that we're yeah. going to do. Because if I'm hearing you right, Chairman, it sounds like because you're asking for more more money, it, it's different than before. Because before, if you were out of money, generally speaking, Where's the where's the next seventy five thousand dollars of the projects on the list? If what I'm hearing, and maybe I'm hearing you incorrectly, but let me see if I understand. You're saying the Centennial Commission wants to be more involved in some of these, these community uh, outreach is probably the wrong word, but these community efforts, whether it's HBC or otherwise. And uh, what you're saying is 
I think that if we're, if we're talking to them about what the allocation to the HPC should be for the coming year, it ought to be larger than before because they're going to be more interested in the community efforts they're making. Am I, kind of, am I going down the right track or no? Yes. Okay. So. The goal is lower. Okay. I, sorry, I, I think quickly. So I'll slow my. So, what, what I think I, I understand from now, what Courtney's saying is, in, in, the, in the recent past, they've said, they, Centennial Commission, has said, spend your money before you ask for more. So what I hear is, her suggestion, I think, as to how to get an increase in the funds available to the HBC would be to allocate what's in there now, and then instead of just going to them with a number, you would have some something attached to that larger number than the usual 75 to, uh, to justify the increased uh, ask from 75,000 to some larger number. So instead, I think, I think that's why she's recommending we probably ought to be able to spend this money and then also have a list, which would be different than you have done in the past. 60,000 is for money that we spend. The 25,000 you're asking for is for small grants. That's a separate. Well, what what the what the um, amend the amendments would say twenty five thousand dollars would come from that remaining sixty three and be put into small grants because we we would be asking to replenish that twenty five thousand dollars from the operating expenses every year, so that would leave forty something for for whatever projects. Thirty five, but that be right, be right, and, and so what I'm suggesting is the sequence of events between this this group and the Centennial is, the Centennial Commission says to the HPC, we're going to give you $75,000 a year. We're going to give you $75,000 a year. Go set up your process on how, how, you're going to, how you're going to allocate that money. We have been spending the $75,000 each year. And they're saying, go spend that money, and then you can come back and get your $75,000. But it was clearly established at the very beginning of this process as you Fred well said, specifically, we are going to allocate $75,000 a year to the HPC. Go figure out how, how you're going to do it, small grant, because we're going to take care, take care of the big one. So what I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting is that at the last meeting, we said, hey, we got some small projects, but we're out of small project money. Can't we just move some of the $60,000 uh, uh, over to small grants. And that's what and this does, correct? That's, that's what, that's what One time only. Oh. It does not, it would not, it would not allow them to just move it over during a meeting. Right. No, no, no. When you run, I, okay, the way I thought you were proposing is on a, on a, when they run out of money in small grants, we would, we would, the planning department would then reallocate from large grants into the small grants. Once per year. Oh, once per year. Right, at okay. the beginning of the year, before that first grant cycle, when we submit the budget for a review. Yeah. So right now, in our budget, or in our, in our bank account, we have $60,000. Right, 62-something. And, and this amendment would allow us to take 25 of the 62, move it over into, into small grants. Or, or we don't. And we take the $62,000, and at our June meeting, we allocate that to the projects of hundreds three, four, five, six, and twelve, and and we spend that sixty thousand dollars. Then we would be allowed to go back to the Centennial Commission at the line meeting and say, we'd like the seventy-five thousand dollar annual fee. And we never in, in the first year and since then we haven't said this is how we're going to spend it other than divide it between small grants and, and big grants. There was a list that was approved in that first MOU of. Various things. The general, right. the it's, general, it starts. General, it starts the on the bottom, okay. but we do have a list. It says just basically historic survey, re research and documentation, nomination reports, commissioner training, historic markers and plaques, and then small grants and awards. And I, I suspect that that still holds true because that's the history of how we spend it. And the APC has spent our, the money very judiciously because we haven't spent it all. Right. We can go right check. So is, is that sequence of events, if you were to come up and for our June meeting and say, I guess what you guys want to do, 
you want to spend that sixty thousand dollars on hundred one two three four and five or or whatever, we could do that, and that money would then be allocated uh, or spent over the next period of time, and then we would be able to ask at the July meeting for the uh, for their annual seventy five thousand dollars. We listen. We're going to spend it like that. So. You want to move forward with the the twenty five thousand being moved into not necessarily okay. Mm -hmm. no, not, I think that that's almost uh, it became a side issue uh, to okay. a degree because if we got the seventy five thousand dollars in approved by the Centennial Commission, that would contain small grant money. Mm -hmm. But again, there's a, there's a filter through all this, and that's five projects. I mean, I think that that's always got to be. What, what we what we do until we figure out that plan out. We, we get two million dollars, but we can only still handle five five projects. Well, I mean that's you know that's just an arbitrary number that 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 I've been able to sort of semi deal with. But I, what I'm saying is, if it's five huge projects, right. that's a completely different sure. story. But I'm saying five projects within our scope of within our scope of things. And five, you know, five historic surveys is would be tough. Mm -hmm. uh, question, but and, and and I understand what you're saying, and I don't have a problem with that. But I, I guess I go back to what I thought we started out from the beginning. Even if we ask for the, we spend the money, and that's that makes sense. And then we ask for the seventy-five thousand dollars in July. But again, we still only have the twenty-five thousand. Am I correct? That goes to the small grants. That's it. So. You were talking about increasing the budget. So, I mean, even if we get that at the beginning of the year, again, we're back where we were, where we are now. <coughs> because we haven't added anything to the list that she's read to justify an increase of, from 75,000, say, to 100. That's also an element. That could be at. I was just trying to get it to a square root. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To be clear, that's all Esther does, yeah. and and the vets. And even with yeah. that, it, it's it's just I mean the hundreds is going to be a massive opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> so, director of planning. Yes. Uh, do we want to think about this till our next meeting? Is there any way that uh, you want you guys want to get your heads together? I mean, you've heard the situation. I think we're going to have to spend $65,000 and get those projects, those five projects. Yeah. Yeah. So we request our, next July, our budget for the next July, but in that time, think of what we want to look at consultants or something else that we want to add to the list of things that our $75,000 budget includes. Yeah. Now, we might want to add things so that when we go in July, we add those additional things that we feel we need this, we need 100000 because we need to add a consultant for these various projects. We need to add such and such, and this is what we're going to do. Expanding our horizons. That we have to, uh, what we have before us is, uh, is, is, the actual item 25,000 is and then number eight, which is HBC 5414 over possible action okay. regarding possible amendments to the First Amendment of the amended and restated memorandum of understanding between the Commission for the City, uh, for the Las Vegas Centennial and the City of Las Vegas. So any motion that we make has to fall within, within that 
and it can't be a major substantive change. I think our that right? yeah. yeah, I think our attorney has a potential solution for us. And well, I just wonder if we just. I wonder if if everyone's ha happy or generally happy with the direction that the staff has provided on the agenda item. If we move forward with the agenda item, and then direct staff to come back next month with other possible amendments that we could take forward to the Centennial and July meeting. Now that we've kind of heard what it is you want to do, uh, then we can bring them back for discussion. But I, what would, I would hate to do is slow down what we've already done. Uh, but I'm not sure that gets that gets you where you want to be. So if, if we decide to obey uh, well, I'm not, no, I'm not, I'm not, no, I'm yes, saying, if we decide to obey this to next month, what has slowed down? We couldn't obey, we had to change. Well. It's a whole different item for the five projects and all that. So, yeah, if we're, if, if the two, okay, so, what you can do based upon what we've posted and what we've presented is you can give the, the HPO direction as to what amendments you want her to ask the Centennial Commission to make to your document, right? That's what you can do under what we've listed as, uh, as the agenda item. Okay. If we want to talk about, uh, let's have a list of five projects and we want to spend that money somehow, even though we don't know how much those projects are going to cost or how we're going to allocate the funds or what they are, that has to be a different item. That you got it. Right? So what I'm what I'm proposing is that there's no real reason why because if we approve this, <coughs> it changes uh, it takes money out of the sixty thousand dollars. Right. And, and, and you would only have thirty five thousand dollars left. I, I'm not sure that that then the, the the motion would have to be as we go down to item number thirteen. It would have to be uh, come back uh, at our next meeting and how we would spend the thirty-five thousand. Right. If if we and, can and if happened? we can properly allocate thirty-five thousand uh, to these projects, and I don't know. You know, I don't know how that happens, but yeah, I think we can. I, I have a sort of a suggestion. Maybe We're, we we've gotten our award letter from or, or allocation letter from the from SHPO for the two thousand fourteen grant. We were only awarded twenty-five thousand. So we could probably spend, and I remember $6,000 is going to the structural survey, so that's $29,000 left. So we could probably use that to allocate, you know, a, a, a historic contact for uh, World War II and a windshield survey. If we wanted to just lump that, we could supplement that SHPO grant with that money and get rid of it in one fell swoop. Okay, hold that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Have we already spent the twenty-five thousand dollars? Are the project waiting for us? No, that's done. The, the grant money? No, I'm just no. This, this twenty-five thousand that we're going to move over. No, there's just there's project ideas that that the HPC prioritized at one time um, that that are attached on this budget under operating expenses. They're kind of general. Um, they sort of follow what this list was that was approved in the MOU. Um, with some funding amounts tied to to some of the smaller ones, but uh, we they're not specific. So we're not going to hurt anything if we if we deny this if we turn this motion down or delay it. We don't have a specific problem. There's nobody waiting at your door that says I'm going to starve if I don't get a small grant. Well, this is Andrew's type of thing, so I think so. Right, and and the, and the MOU would the amendment would say that the twenty five thousand dollars doesn't move over until uh, the next grant cycle, which would be March of two thousand fifteen. So I think the, the options for us are one is that we we would approve this and that would reduce the sixty two thousand dollars to thirty thirty seven minus six. So we would have $31,000 that we would have Courtney come back and suggest to us. Or we would say forget this, moving this money, and come back with how you would spend 
6,062 minus 658, 56,000. So it's either we want to come back with $31,000 worth of projects or 56,000 worth of projects. And again, the focus is still going to be what you can handle. Well, yeah. So we can deny this, we can just say, no, we're going to vote this down, and then when we get to item 13, recommend that you come back on the, on the, with a, uh, an item on the next agenda for the 31 or for the 56 or 8. Thoughts? Well, I mean, if we take the, if we go for this, then we take the 25 out, but we still have to spend the money. Right. And we're not going to be able to spend the money. So we might as well just deny this. And then, because if we, if we go towards putting the 25 That's correct, because that has to be approved by the, uh, the, the that came up we can do a lot. Yeah. And we just have 25,000 in our hands. Well, yeah, the one practical issue, Chairman, is that if you if we proceed with with what we're, we're suggesting as far, you're going to have 25,000 in your small grant account waiting for those grants to come in. If you do nothing with this, if you deny this, then we start over. You know, we start over. We can add that back in, I suppose. Right, the 25,000 years But we start years. over though, and, and our normal, uh, we have told the Centennial Commission we spent all the money. Now we'd like our annual $75,000 back. That will contain small grant money. So it's not like we're, we're not going to have small grant money after July. Well, I think it was, I think it was March. No, it just, the, the um, amendment would not, the amendment would. It would state that the money gets rolled over every year in March. So, or or at the beginning of the the, whenever we we go to the uh, HPC, I think approves the budget in January. So it would be January. So it would be ready for the March cycle. So this amendment is like we get seventy five thousand dollars, and of that seventy five, twenty five goes to small grants. The rest of it goes to books and more. No, no, that's not how it's set up originally. No. The amendment would be to nope. to I'm not the amendment. Plan. How is this budget? Generally, how much of the oh. seventy five goes to small? No, twenty five thousand. Yeah. Okay. So right. with the seventy five thousand grant grants, and we get our seventy five thousand a year. Twenty five automatically goes to small grants. The rest goes to bricks and more. No, no the rest or surveys or whatever. Right. It's, it's it's set over here. Okay. And then that amendment would say. Every year in March, after which we presumed you've already spent the twenty-five thousand in small grants, you can take another twenty-five thousand if you want to from this money sitting to your side, sitting the six from whatever that is. Yeah. No, it's just one time. So right. it's a one-time twenty-five thousand dollars. Period. Correct. And this this was made. Well, and and keep in mind too that if it's not an additional in addition to, I don't understand. Well, yeah, we, we asked, it comes we out asked, already. We asked Courtney when when I think it was last at our last meeting that we wanted. To, I think we wanted to spend some money on some small things, and we asked if we could switch the money from our. I'll call for it right, to this is because we'd already spent our twenty-five, yeah, yeah. so yeah. we're trying to be use an additional twenty-five. But she's saying the amendment doesn't provide for it. What we wanted was it was to get you more money. You, you the commission asked us to get you more money in small grants. Right. This was the this was to get you more money in small grants because you weren't spending the money in the other account. You can't get more money in the other account until you spend all that money in the other account. So this was to reallocate money from big account to small account to re to to refurbish small accounts. Right, but you said that we already have that and that yeah. this amendment won't add to what we already get. Yeah, that. there's been a lot of things said today by a lot of people and I think that's creating some confusion. Right. Yeah, I, and so uh, until you until we can draw actually draw down on the money, not just say that we're going to spend s some money, actually draw down and spend it, you don't get another uh, allocation from Centennial. So you don't get twenty five thousand more there. You don't get any more in the big account. You don't get in a small account. This, what Courtney has done for you, if approved by Centennial and this commission, would would reallocate some money. So we've got some small grant money there, and then we could. It sounds like Courtney 
has a way to allocate those funds, the remaining 31,000, because we didn't get everything we needed from SHPO. That then um, sounds like it would deplete the large account, which would then help us trigger uh, Correct. more money into the large account. There's one piece of information I think so. When will we formally, can we ask the Centennial Commission at any time during the fiscal year for our money, 75000 or does it have to come at the annual budget cycle? I think it's best to do it at the budget cycle. That's what they've requested of us. Okay, but well we can't ask for it at any time. I believe so, but I'm not oh, sure. Okay. Does anybody else do it? Too? Right, does anybody, does yeah. anybody else do it? I think if they're going to budget all their money at that annual budget meeting. And so for us to step in later, I, 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 I was at that last meeting. I did these, these folks are, 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 are in, okay, the rest they want to get the money out in the okay. community plan. Okay. Uh, uh, there was a reduction in the, uh, they say, from keeping about a million dollars in the back pocket down to keeping a quarter million dollars. Uh, a sign. I don't think they're going to go willy nilly. Just the second time I've used that for anybody. <laughs> in, in the interest of time, let's maybe see if we can do this. Based on your conversations, let's go ahead and move the 25000 to small grants. Next month, we will allocate the remainder of our budget towards projects, and we've already discussed the way to do that with the balance of the SHPO funds that we didn't get and then request the 75000 at the Centennial Commission meeting in July. So that way we've expended this year's budget and are requesting 75000 Does that seem like an agreeable yeah, path? The motion that covers a lot of what we're trying to get done. So, uh, but that also, that also, so we can go to the Centennial Commission, and it's, even though we have 25000 in small grants, and say, okay, we have that aside, but we're out of money. Correct. Yeah. Cause it's, because it's, it's been allocated. Okay. The only thing that doesn't do is increase our budget. Right. I don't have a problem with what you're saying, the first part, but I didn't hear to request an increase to our July budget. That's, and to me, that's what all, all, all of this has been about, is trying to increase our budget. Okay, so, so I don't have a problem with that. Especially with the excuse of shippers giving us less money. Right. So we mm -hmm. like to keep at least what we're doing on an even par, so we need more money. So it sounds like next month we'll talk about what your budget should be if it's not 75000 Right. I don't have a problem with the twenty-five. Okay. what she's doing now, but I really would like to see an increase come into the July budget from seventy-five to twenty-five. dollars okay. Let me just ask your attorney, we can, can we make all of that, what the director said, in one motion, or should we just approve this uh, item and then in item 13 come back with... The latter, the latter, because here's here's what you do: you approve this, and then just direct direct planning the the HPO to come back with an additional amendment for the same for the, for the same uh, at some higher funding source. You want to have an agenda. You want the you want the public to understand that you're asking for more money. Okay, this doesn't make that clear. You don't want someone to come back and say, no one told us you wanted more money. We wanted to come down to object, or we wanted to come down and be in support of you. So my, my advice to you is take action here, direct them to bring something back that would add another amendment, uh, increasing uh, the, budget. the budget, and have that uh, discussion then. Okay, uh, okay. I'm going to move to approve this. I'll say. For the discussion, public? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, we are now on item nine. Courtney, anything you want to add on item nine? Um, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who came to the parade. That was fun. Um, I actually have a couple of thank you cards that. I made, don't laugh. Um, uh, these are just for the, the T Bird guys and then the uh, Truth 144 that carried the banners, if you guys wouldn't mind signing them. Um, and uh, the food tour. <laughs> no, I jumped in the T Bird for a couple blocks. Okay. They got hot. <laughs> and it was hotter in the car, actually. Um, 
th those guys were really into it. They want to do it every year. Next year they said they want to decorate. They'll let us do whatever because the cars are not in what they call show quality. So they don't mind if we tape stuff to them or if we, you know. They were great cars. They were, great cars. They, they they were, were fantastic, cars. yeah. I thought they were really, it was fun. So um, if, we'll probably open the invitation to the, the Cadillac guys and these guys and see, let them duke it out, but we'll see what happens. Um, the, the food tour I thought was really good. If, uh, for those of you who went, I know Mary went. She said that she enjoyed it. Um, we, it was, I thought it was fantastic. They did a lot of hard work. It was terrific, and, and yeah. the food was so good. It was unbelievable. It was really good, and the restaurants were really happy to be a part of it, so maybe right. we'll do it again next year. Um, and I think uh, the award ceremony went well. Bob, I didn't know if you wanted to add anything to that. Courtney, no. I think they're going to try to do the food thing again in October, too, for statehood. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a nice crowd, uh, uh, a great representation of people who got awards. Uh, I thought it went well. The, the mayor said some, some very nice things about the park preservation. Uh, I thought it just went uh, very nice. And Courtney came to the rescue once again at, at the end <laughs> with some notes that were very helpful. Item number 11, uh, local media reports. Any questions or any comments on that? Item number 11, report uh, the Department of Planning regarding Dr. Uh, the, uh, let's see what we haven't already talked about. Um, uh, the Berkeley Square Historic District, uh, Whitney is working on um, uh, revising the nomination slightly to submit it for state uh, designation. I spoke to Ruth Don't with the Neighborhood Association and Ruth said that she thought that the neighborhood would be in support. We'll probably end up having one meeting with their neighborhood association just to make sure that everybody gets notified of it. But as you guys are, are aware, the state nomination does not imply any um, restrictions on the property owners, just, just to staff like the, new, the National Register. Um, and uh, I think we talked about Fort Lamb. I think that's it. Is there any questions? We have none. Report uh, number 12, report by the Department of Planning on the downtown project list. Sorry that I've missed the last couple of months. Let me just go over a couple of projects very quickly. Um, the first one identified as Project 65 is the Ferguson's Motel project, which is at 10th and Fremont. They've already been approved for three tavern limiteds there on the site. They're requesting one additional tavern limited, and then they would add a, uh, a covered uh, porch area onto the building that respects the historic architecture of the original structure, and then doing an amphitheater in the center of it. That's 65? That's project number 65. The yep, yep. Um, they're just having one more neighborhood meeting, and this will go back to city council in June. Uh, item 67 is in the entertainment district. This is a 6,500 square foot grocery store. This is where the former Mamita's restaurant was in the adjoining space. Um, but they intend to have a grocery store there in the entertainment district. So we're looking forward to that project. And then project number 78 on your list is a, uh, an assisted living facility and medical office space and accessory retail space in the uh, Symphony Park uh, development. It would be kind of catty corner across from the Smith Center there. That was just recently approved as final action at Planning Commission. And those are kind of the, the bigger projects from the list. Question? Item 13. Uh, discussion regarding topic for further future agenda items by the Historic Preservation Commission. Comments made during the portion of the agenda by the Historic Commission members shall refer solely proposals for future agenda items that any discussion shall be given to whether or not any such proposed items are within the purview of the commission and whether such proposed items should be placed on the future agenda. No discussion regarding the substance of any proposed topic shall occur and no action shall be taken regarding that proposal. Does anybody like to put anything on the agenda regarding uh, the budget that's going to go to the... Yeah, I'd like to see that. 
I mean, some type of a discussion for the increase of the July budget. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm going to have to read the minutes. So <laughs> yeah, spend down the remainder and then request additional funds. That's what staff heard. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. do, do us a favor. Uh, next time we have this conversation, let's, let's talk about how we justify the increased amount. So when uh, the minutes are read by the Supreme Commission members, they can really have an understanding of why more funds are even more. I'm not just arbitrarily saying. No, I know that. Money. I'm, That's what I'm I mean, saying. I mean, if we add money, we're going to have to. I understand. We certainly need some justification. That's why. Right. That's why I suggested. Uh, yeah. So to make clear, the, the uh, what we'd like to see in the next agenda is how we're going to spend the 31 or whatever the remainder, and also what we're going to propose for the Centennial Commission for our annual budget. Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. Is the public allowed to speak at this point? We've got to wait for the next agenda. Citizen participation, public comment during this portion of the agenda must be limited to matters of business jurisdiction. Public comment during the agenda should be limited to matters of business jurisdiction. Public comment during the agenda should be limited to matters of business jurisdiction. Public comment during the agenda should be limited to matters of business jurisdiction. Public comment during the agenda should be limited to matters of business jurisdiction. Public comment during the agenda should be limited to matters of business jurisdiction. Public comment during the agenda should be limited to matters of business jurisdiction. Public comment during the agenda should be limited to matters of business jurisdiction. Public comment during the agenda should be limited to matters of business jurisdiction. Public comment during the agenda should be limited to matters of business jurisdiction. Public comment during the agenda should be limited to matters of business jurisdiction. Public comment during the agenda should be limited to matters of business jurisdiction. Public comment during the agenda should be limited to matters of business jurisdiction. Public comment during the agenda should be limited to matters of business jurisdiction. Okay. Can I say something? Yes. For the record? Yes. Based on. Oh, for your Oh, should I sit here? So, do tell me. Oh, I'm Peter Maruzzi uh, with ICF International, based in Los Angeles, California. Based on your discussion that you had about okay. allocations of funds, our firm wants to work with the city on additional projects. However, any project, any survey, anything that now involves SHPO, is going to be problematic for us because they have a limitation on how much they allow to pay. They limit it to $84 an hour. And our firm charges my rates higher than that. We cut way back on what we were willing to accept because we wanted to do this project. We wanted to get a foot in the door of the city. But we won't be able to do any more of these surveys if we have to be limited to SHPO's requirements. So my suggestion would be if you want to find a way to allocate funds, do it without having SHPO's uh, restrictions on how much consultants can be paid. According to that money, would that would only restriction would come from whatever money we got from SHPO? Well, right, but maybe there might be a way that we could parcel out some of the projects with the, with the scope change.